the cold storage. A foreboding cavern layer deep in the bowels of the pride layer. The air here was cool. The ceiling so high, the glow lichen growing on it made it appear like stars. And the luminescent crystal structure at its center created an ominous equivalent to a moon. As long as you were in the central chamber, of course. Here, countless generations of sinner-born demons had appeared, originally meant for the pentagram. The chance to end up here was relatively low, which made it so, for the thousands of years the cold storage existed, it had never been overcrowded. Its waters glowed due to bioluminescent bacteria that was surprisingly nutritious and definitely not weird and gross. And strange mutations of regular demons wandered the endless, twisting hallways and passages. Once there were about three narrow tunnels that led to the outskirts of the pentagram, but due to a project led by the V-Empire, a large tourist tunnel right at the center of the V-Territory had been carved out. And for the first time since ever, contact with the strange cave dwellers of the cold storage had been created. Part feral, part insane, and part eremite, cold storage dwellers kept to themselves and were quite unpredictable. As a matter of fact, since the construction project by the V's had been finished, the cold storage had experienced only a single extermination. Due to the low population and their feralness, angels considered this place not worth the effort especially after many angels lost multiple limbs to the borderline cannibalistic monstrosities hiding in the caves beneath. Or, as Adam had put it, who had been still alive at the time, they're a bigger danger to demons than to us. Let's kill something easier, okay? Despite the danger, however, tourism flourished. Especially among more powerful demons and overlords. The flora of the cold storage was a sight to behold. Seaweed that grew on land but still flowed as if underwater. Mushrooms that grew in the shape of benches that smelled like pine resin. Flowers that grew blind, unblinking eyeballs shaped bulbs that tasted like beef. And most famously, vines covered in thick layers of white chitin, making them look like skeleton fingers growing from walls, ceilings, and the ground, that the dwellers grew and turned into bony tools and weapons. And some tourists enjoyed the challenge of fighting an overgrown lizard demon so monstrous and feral, not even itself knew if it was hellborn or sinnerborn anymore. And it was here, Lucifer Morningstar had decided to have a little vacation just for himself. It was the former Archangel's first visit to the cold storage, and he simply wanted to see more of his own kingdom. After all, not even he knew of the cold storage's existence until his butler Priminger read him the newspaper the other day that talked about a new size record of demon discovered there. And besides, it had been a long while since the last time he experienced the thrill of being in danger. Not to mention, maybe Little Safari would make him not think of his failed marriage every ten seconds. He crawled out of his tent and stood up, hands on his hips. He had set up camp near a lake. Bony plants as thick as trees poked out of the glowing liquid. It was hauntingly beautiful and quiet. He chose this place because it was relatively flat, and thanks to being located on a slope, also quite dry. Additionally, very close to one of the outposts, where demons lived. So he felt a little safer. He started off his day with breakfast. Sushi from his portable fridge. Fresh as it had been made just ten minutes ago by his butler Piminger. The fridge worked two ways. Its counterpart was stationed in the royal kitchen. The fridge worked on the principle of Schrodinger's cat. When closed, the meal was in both fridges, and then appeared in whichever was opened next. 
To avoid the destruction of reality, the counterbat fridge was unable to be used when the other was open. After his tasty meal, Lucifer went down the lake with toothbrush and paste. He poked the glowing water with the brush and then put the paste on it. The liquid was safe enough to drink as such safe enough to brush his teeth with. He eyed around the cavern he was in. Three twisting tunnels led to this place. One big enough for him to walk up straight, the other two so small he needed to transform into a snake form to fit through them. So technically, it was just one. Overall, the cold storage was slightly bigger than the pentagram, but not bigger than the entire circle. Spitting out the foam onto a rock, he returned to his tent. This was supposed to be a safari after all. Lucifer never went on one. The way he understood it, it was a mix of hunting and sightseeing. He put on a hat with a lamp and some leather padding for his knees, shoulders and elbows, plus some gloves, just in case he stumbled. With an almost eager expression, he then began marching the way he had come, the bag stuffed with rations hanging on his back. The chamber his tent stood in had a tea section. Of course, he only walked the tourist paths, so everything was heavily mapped and lit by torches when sections didn't have any glowing flora. There were markers too. The only real danger aside from encountering a cave dweller was by slipping into a narrow tunnel that was yet unexplored. But there were a couple of simple rules given. If you needed to crawl to enter something, don't! If a tunnel was shut with wood but you really want to squeeze through, don't! If there was a puddle, put your finger in it. If you reached the ground, it was safe to traverse. Otherwise, don't! These puddle-appearing pits were especially common in the mushroom forests. The going theory was that mushrooms had grown there which had died, leaving behind the tunnels their roots had burrowed. They were the most common danger for tourists and very often marked. Still, it was practically impossible to mark them all. After navigating dank tunnels and moldy smelling caverns, Lucifer made his way to a very interesting dome shaped cave. It was called the Surface. Of course, it wasn't anywhere near the surface. It was simply called that due to how beautifully lit up it was. As the dome's entire ceiling was covered by translucent quartz crystals that mirrored and enhanced any light shining through them. Combine that with the cold storage's typically starry looking ceiling, it was almost as bright as day here. The ecosystem here too was equally surfacey. And even some actual trees. Wow, half Lucifer, as he stepped through the area. It smelled like a flower garden here. The fact that Hell was capable of creating such beauty was making him almost feel at peace. And a strong feeling of smugness overcame him as he thought about heaven. You just didn't get a sight like this up there, where everything was safe, boring and controlled. He approached a glowing water river stopping behind a tree to observe a group of dwellers. They were among the most common of kind. Snail women. They looked like thin, almost malnourished females, with long, sticky, tendril-like hair and pearl-white bodies, and the appearance of someone covered from head to toe in melted wax. They were attached to shell-shaped rocks. It seemed like it was feeding time. To feed, snail women placed their upper bodies on the water surface, appearing almost like swimming corpses. They patiently waited for fish to swim close enough for their deadly long arms to catch and devour them. Even though they acted like animals, they were in fact sinner-born, and despite being very common in the cold storage, almost unheard of in the pentagram. Because of that, dealmakers were eager to catch one just to brag about owning an exotic soul. Lucifer gasped. One of them had caught a fish. The water bubbled as it struggled in the woman's grasp, but 
too late. The snail woman quickly, like a snake, pulled back into her shell with fish in hand. The king of hell spent hours watching them catch fish, but once all of them had caught their daily prey, there wasn't anything to see but shell-shaped rocks. So he stood up and continued further into the surface. It was getting noon, and sure, you had no grasp on the time, but your biological clock was telling you it was time to eat. <sighs> you were so hungry. It had been weeks since you last fed on something other than moss and algae. On all fours, you crawled over the cold, sharp rocks. The ceiling was so bright here it was quite uncomfortable. But delicious morsels grew everywhere here. Carefully, you climbed up a tree, thanks to your limber body. From its crown, you spotted movement all around you. And then, down there, you saw them, snails. Salvia dripped from your lips. They were pure meat, no bones, just muscles, minus the nails on their fingers. Your stomach growled. Possessed by your hunger, you threw your body off the tree, slapping on the ground like a sack of potatoes, before quickly huddling forward. You learned quickly that all fours movement was preferred in the cold storage. It was faster, safer, and better camouflaged. Relatively far away from your prey, you slid into the glowing water. It was cool and light. It was a bit like a reverse pool. The glowing layer was just a few millimeters thick. With your feet floating behind you, you crawled, using your hands, over the squishy, algae-covered stone ground. You didn't need to breathe, so you could remain here for a while. And then, you saw the snail. You pressed yourself tightly against the bottom. Her hair, her hands, her eyes, scanning the ground beneath her for fish. You waited for a gaze to shift opposite to you before you lunged up. The snail woman could feel the water's movement as you shot towards her like a bullet, but it was too late. Just as her head lifted out of the water, you came with it. In a swift motion, your hands clasped around her head. You pulled, and she screamed in pain, her hands slapping against your body, trying to cause damage. With your legs, you pushed against the rocks for purchase as you slowly pulled the snail out of her shell. With a loud, fleshy noise, you pulled off her torso from her slimy lower half. With your teeth surly sunken into her shoulder, you pulled her back into the water. Her silvery blood spewing everywhere. And seconds later, it was silent again. Lucifer heard the struggle while he was having a little picnic. And he had gotten up on his feet, quickly jogging towards the river, where he had seen the snail women. Though from the distance, he couldn't make out what was going on there. His eyes widened, though, as suddenly from the water's edge a hunched figure emerged. In its grasp, a white, lifeless body. Lucifer snapped his fingers, summoning binoculars into his hands to get a closer look. His breath shallow, he watched. Oh, an omen, he said quietly. Omens were female-only demons, usually of Asian descent. They had paper-white skin like most dwellers, long black hair and blood-red eyes. On their bodies, they usually wore tattered white nightgowns, which they spawned into hell with. 
Charlie was scared of them, as they could spend days without moving a single muscle, which is where the term omen came from. It was said a person who saw an omen move a muscle would be their next target. They were ambush predators, but it seemed like the cold storage had turned you into more an active hunter. He blushed. Even your dress was barely covering your body at this point. What the hell happened to you down here? And if you weren't malnourished and covered in silvery gore, he might would even have called you attractive. With your sharp teeth, you were tearing into the slimy meat of the snail woman, while your fingers dug through the squishy, soft meat. But just as Lucifer was about to return to his picnic, your two red eyes shot towards him. You were seeing him. Having smelled his sweat, his fear, you dropped the meat, flesh and blood dripping from your jaws. You're breathing heavily out of your mouth. Your eyes widened. Clearly you are still overexcited from the hunt. Still, bloodlust was running through your veins. And a strange feeling overcame Lucifer. He knew in the back of his mind he could just snap and your body would explode. And then he would have to rearrange itself over the next couple of days, but... Instead, a primal fear made itself known. And what he did was... Turn on his heels. And run. Run faster than he has ever run. It was a mistake, though. Had he stayed, your animalistic brain would have registered that he isn't afraid of you and that perhaps you should be instead. But now, now he too had become prey. And he looked much more thick and juicier and plump than the snail. Breathing heavily, smelling a feast, you shoved your hand into the open stomach, pulling out some stringy meat putting it in your mouth before chasing after Lucifer. As you ran, you chewed and swallowed, feeling invigorated. If it wasn't for the snail, you would not have had the strength to chase after the man. You could almost hear his blood pumping. Closer and closer you came. And then, suddenly, you watched him grow wings, and he flapped up into a tree. Completely taken by surprise, you ran into it head first. Screaming and whining, you fell on your back, both hands pressed on your forehead. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, <clears throat> that's what you get, he shouted down at you. After a few minutes of heavy breathing and whining, the pain turned to a bothering pulse, but you could focus on other things again. Rolling onto your stomach, you looked around, like a cat. It smelled nice here. You leaned back until you sat on your butt with a quiet thud. You were growling out of your mouth as you sniffed. Next to you was a backpack. And that's when Lucifer realized he had run back to his picnic. He gulped as he watched you see through his food and bag. He then saw you pull out a piece of cooked lamp that was packed in aluminum foil. <laughs> you tore into it before shoving the meat into your gaping jaws. You tore through it. Lucifer slowly wiggled forward on the branch he was clutching for dear life. He had an idea just a little closer. He was, of course, still scared of you. His heart pounded. He watched you shuffle closer to the tree with the meat still in your mouth. And that's when he shook his head. Finally, a thought had appeared in his mind. He was big, strong, right? King of hell and stuff. So, why was he afraid of a malnourished, half-naked lady? It took him a moment. Oh yeah, those teeth. Still though, 
to keep the dignity of the Morningstar name and to prove to his not present divorced significant other Lilith, he was still a man, all right? With an obsession for rubber duckies. After all, he fought much bigger opponents, much stronger opponents. Just two months ago, he fought Adam. <sighs> Lucifer bit the nails on his right thumb. There was a time where he was feared. <sighs> what the hell happened to him? He turned his right hand into a fist. He would prove he was still king. He would not use angel powers on you. That was a little unfair, right? With an angry expression, he then let go of the tree branch, jumping off of it. But as he was falling, for a moment, his brain reset. Hang on, is it really something to be proud of? Beating up a starving homeless girl in the middle of a deep, dank cave? Yourself had completely forgotten Lucifer was even there. And by the time he had landed on top of you, your instincts took over, and you felt your bodies clash. You thrashed, beat, and clawed at his hips and body, while he was completely dumbfounded. His brain was still resetting, after all. Screaming like a banshee, you wrestled on the yellow grass. It was exhilarating. Why? Your slashes left behind deep cuts on his clothes and even managed to penetrate his angelic skin. A telltale sign that your claws were very deadly. Not by much though, just enough to draw blood. Still, it was a worthy attempt. By the time he was able to think again, he had you pinned down. His hands pressed down on your upper arms, making it so you couldn't use them. Your legs kept in place by his knees. He was out of breath. Why was he breathing so heavily? Meanwhile, panic breaths came from you. Wow. Up close, you could see how wide your mouth was. Challengingly, you stared up at him. And Lucifer tilted his head. He was wondering what you were thinking. Wait, how was he going to get off of you? If he let go, those teeth would definitely sink into his neck, and well, your claws gripped the clove scraps around your... If he let go, those teeth would definitely sink into his neck, and... Huh? Oh god. Your claws had gripped the cloth scraps around your chest. What the hell were you doing? Well, moving a muscle in your face... You tore them off. Oh, 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 oh! He averted your gaze. Shit, you got the wrong idea. He was panicking. His heart raced and he began sweating, which, too, you interpreted wrong. A cooing noise came from you. Lucifer raised his head, staring up at the ceiling. He closed his eyes, pushed air through his teeth and... Fine. He looked down at you and then went for a kiss. Though, the moment your lips touched, and he could feel your cool, sleek skin against his own, it was as if your strength had suddenly returned. The contact lasted only for a few seconds. His eyes widened as an incredible strength pushed him to the side, and after a painful barrel roll, you were once again on top. Your slender thighs squeezing his legs together. You were staring down at him. Lucif couldn't help but breathe through his mouth, impressed. Your eyes went up and down his body, and he felt a little awkward. Your lips twitched into an evil Cheshire smile. That's when you grabbed his collar. Please don't, Prim can still fix my suit. He didn't get to finish the sentence as he ripped his clothes apart, revealing that he didn't have any muscles, just pale skin. He looked squishy, tasty, adorable even. He was so round. Come on, that suit was expensive. He paused. 
Do you even understand the concept of money? You tilted your head. Let me guess. Speaking English no longer is your strong suit, huh? How long have you been down here? I mean, clearly long enough to be super touch starved. Smirking you through your upper body on his. Squeezing your body and chest against his. He winced when you rubbed over his fresh wounds. You brushed your cheek against his, enjoying the softness of his body. Okay, okay, and, uh... uh you licked his neck, scraping your teeth over his skin, feeling him, tasting him, his sweat, his flesh. It was delicious. Salty, squishy. Oh, God, why does this feel so good? He said. Your touches were almost gentle. Almost. His hands went up your hips. Your body felt like silicone. Well, almost like silicone. The only warmth was located roughly around your tummy. Other than that, it was cold, like a water-soaked corpse. But it was just the right amount of soft for him to bury his thumbs into your skin in a way that made you coo in pleasure and pain. One of your hands squeezed his chest, squeezing his sensitive spots almost curiously, like you were trying to figure out his pain threshold, as well as cause him pleasure. Your nails scraped over his body. You watched him twitch at your touches. He inhaled through his mouth, and then... Oh, wait, wait, stop! He pushed against you, and you hissed. Not the belt. You're not destroying that one. You leaned away, staring at him as he quickly undid the buckle. Charlie gifted me this one on my last bathroom. You're not destroying this one. Confused, you stared at him as he shoved the golden, intricately designed buckle with an apple-shaped ruby at the center in your face. This important, you know, touchy touch. He managed to reach for his bag, as ripped apart as it was. He still threw the buckle in there. Once secure, he sighed. Okay, where were we? Oh yeah, we were about to fu- You placed your hands on his mouth. It felt cold and wet. An almost annoyed deadpan decorated your lips. Seriously, even you thought he talked too much. Ah, <sighs> goddammit. After a quiet moment, you lifted your hand. Fine, fine. He gave you a little smile. Let's just fuck already. It was three weeks later when Charlie entered Lucifer's castle. A big smile on her lips. She wanted to visit her dad, who had just come from vacation. But as she entered the throne room, she was met with a rather peculiar sight. Attached to his throne via heavy chains and a collar, curled up, lied an almost entirely naked woman. Then she was dressed in her mom's old underwear. Lucifer, meanwhile, was sitting on the throne. <gasps> Chai Chai! He jumped up. Hearing him shout, you raised your head, your red eyes meeting Charlie's, as Lucifer jumped over and hugged her. <gasps> oh, it feels like it's been months! Uh... Yeah, Dad, um, what, uh, who is that? Oh, that, he took a step to the side. You, meanwhile, had taken on a more threatening, almost cat-like pose as you growled at Charlie or you saw as an intruder. That's your new mom. She doesn't have a name. I uh, don't think she understands that concept. Uh, I just call her Bitey because she likes to bite stuff. You know, like Primager's tail, the curtains... Uh, my butt. Anyways, what have you been up to? It's been so long. Hey, thank you for making it to the very end of the video. I hope you enjoyed it. And please remember to like and subscribe. But before I say goodbye, I would like to shout out all of my lovely channel members. Especially my darling Stuarts. HuskyHD17. Bella Mare. Mystic Jade 111, Giovanni Moretti, 
Twilight Mia, Angry Boxman, Hella, Melofia, Anonymous Weep, and Nicodemus D. I couldn't do this without your help. Thank you for your continued support. Anyways, I hope you have a nice day. Goodbye.